I will be giving the first lecture on ventilation and perfusion imaging. My only disclosure is I am a consultant for Invicro LLC, a conical military company. I have four objectives for my talk. Uh, first, I want to talk about what has COVID done for VQ scan? What has the impact been? Uh, we're, we're going to look at the techniques used in VQ scans. And as this lecture unfolds, I really want to make it practical. So we're going to learn the long anatomy for interpreting VQ scans and interpretation criteria that's most commonly used. And lastly, we're going to discuss VQ versus CTA in pregnancy. So in terms of the uh, impact, um, for COVID-19 on VQ scans. And one of the hats I do wear is I am the chair of the, for the ACR, for the Commission on Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. So when COVID hit and started hitting in January of 2020, uh, we um, were getting more and more questions about how to handle this. So in terms of society response, the first society that responded was the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging. And they came out in March 19, uh, 2020 um, with, just a statement saying that because many ventilation systems are difficult to completely disinfect and because there are still unknowns about the transmissibility of COVID-19, some institutions have elected to eliminate entirely the ventilation portion of VQ study. Um, and that was their statement. And a week later, the ACR um, came out with uh, a statement um, which was a little bit different uh, than what the SNMI had said, a little bit more detailed. And what we basically said uh, is that due to the possibility of the risk of exposure for COVID-19 to patients and the nuclear medicine technologists, your staff, uh, nuclear medicine department is considered not performing ventilation sc um, scans for the time being. But having said that, even if you don't have a vent scan, there's still valuable information that the perfusion scan can give. So even without the ventilation scan, the um, lung perfusion scan can provide helpful information to the referring physician. For example, if the lung scan is normal or low probability, you would not have had to do the ventilation component anyways. Uh, so you can uh, read that as a, a normal low probability study. If on the other hand, the lung scan has a high probability appearance uh, in a setting of a normal chest X-ray that also provides very helpful information. If the ventilation scan is absolutely necessary, then you should discuss the possibilities of the risks of, having the, of the patient having COVID-19 with the referring physician, and really place the context of performed event scan in the context of the hospital departmental COVID-19 policies and procedures for aerosolized uh, products. Uh, and in this, this is a situation, we also said that you should con consider having a documented negative COVID test, which was much more difficult at that time. So about a year later, things actually got better. This is March 2021 when the next update is. And I'm very happy to say that the ACR and SNMI have been working very closely together. So instead of having separate statements, we've had the SNMI come out with a statement which is endorsed by the ACR and really said that consideration should be given to doing a COVID-19 PCR test, depending on local and institutional guidelines. When performing ventilation studies, the technology should wear full PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, in accordance with the local policies. And it's really dependent upon the airflow of the room and where the vent studies are performed. It should be evaluated to really help determine the required time for room turnover after the performance of ventilation studies. So often we'll try to do these studies at the very end of the day uh, if possible. The selection of the appropriate agent for the ventilation study should be carefully considered. Uh, so many institutions have um, moved over to using uh, xenon gas instead of the aerosolized um, you know, uh, DTPA, uh, just because that will limit uh, exposure to the patient and uh, the occupants uh, and, the, and the staff. Uh, local infection control groups should be engaged for guidance and to help evaluate facilities, equipment, and staff PPE necessary to perform these vent studies. And finally, the approach to performing ventilation scan uh, should be considered because a lot of places were always doing ventilation scans first and then doing a perfusion scan second. But because of COVID, that's really changed um, how a ventilation and, and perfusion scans are performed. And often we'll do the perfusion uh, scan first and only do the ventilation scan if it is necessary. So this presentation, um, you know, it's interesting I've given this presentation at various times during the COVID pandemic, and I've kept some of the earlier slides in there just to give us a little bit of a glimpse back into the past. And I think we all feel like we're a little bit more 
jaded and callous than we were um, back in 2020 when all this was coming along. So I look back on some of these slides and, and you know, see what the perspective is. Uh, but I'll share some of the lessons that we learned and I'll speak both as a nuclear medicine physician um, and also as a chair of a radiology department looking at things as from more of a programmatic perspective. So uh, not news to anybody at this point, SARS-CoV-2, novel coronavirus, uh, first identified in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. Um, there still is probably a little bit of debate on how exactly it's transmissible, but I think it's leaning more towards being aerosolized rather than droplet transmission um, at this point. And interestingly, the RT value that we all pretty closely follow these days uh, is quite high. Um, initially estimated for the original coronavirus at 5.7, and some of the subsequent variants maybe even higher than that. Rapid spread globally um, became a global pandemic, and it was declared in March 11th of 2020, uh, which in some ways seems like it was just yesterday, but again, we've all gone through a lot since then. Um, this was a slide that I uh, had in one of my earlier presentations, and this is uh, the data as of October of 2020, so we're already several months into the pandemic at that point. If you just look at the lower left-hand corner, the number of uh, deaths at that point worldwide, uh, about a million deaths in October of 2020, about 33 million cases diagnosed. I pulled this recently from that same WHO um, website, and you can see the number of cases has gone up to 396, almost 400 million cases worldwide, and the deaths went from a million up to over 5 million, almost 6 million deaths worldwide. Um, so even though the number, you know, the, the pictures on the graph, the color on the graph don't look that, that much different, obviously we saw a large spread of coronavirus during that time. The symptoms we're all familiar with, cough, fever, shortness of breath, loss of smell, GI symptoms. Um, you know, the worry is that in the long run or in certain select patients, it can result in um, SARS, in acute respiratory stress, uh, respiratory syndrome. Um, and actually um, result in severe uh, illness and hospitalization, ICU, and possibly death. The imaging findings were very interesting when they uh, were first being discovered, uh, very characteristic of SARS uh, and coronavirus, ground glass opacities, they tended to be very nodular in configuration, peripheral in, in distribution, um, with areas of superimposed consolidation. Um, and that was first published in the uh, RSNA journals and online with an article entitled Spectrum of Imaging Findings for Coronavirus, SARS uh, Coronavirus. So I live in Houston, Texas, uh, which is currently the fourth largest city in the United States. Um, when you look at the overall numbers in the US, uh, uh, the LA County area generally has the highest number of, of coronavirus cases. You know, maybe the Chicago area somewhat under that, but Houston is right up there. And certainly in the total number of cases, um, Houston is on par with New York City in the number of cases we saw over time. So looking back in time, you know, we were flying along, this is our healthcare system, uh, things were going pretty normally. And I, I say this with a little bit of humility and I'll come back to that, uh, that concept in a little bit. Uh, but this is what we started seeing uh, in the first time when COVID cases were starting to crop up in the Houston area. Um, this is what we saw our cases doing. And if you look again at that bottom, um, this is in uh, January to March of 2020. So in the very early days of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we started to see the number of cases go up. And obviously that triggered some fairly uh, rapid responses and this was occurring nationwide. Our worry was that this would continue to increase uh, at a geometric pace. All right, so without further ado, I get to talk about musculoskeletal imaging. And uh, whenever I think of the musculoskeletal system, I think of sports. And uh, some of my favorite times were spent at Fenway Park watching the ball players. So in terms of disclosures, I have a couple. In turn, uh, I am a consultant for Invicro Conica Minolta, as well as the Center for Probe Development and Commercialization. Otherwise, I have no financial re relationship with a commercial organization that may have a direct or indirect interest on the content of this presentation. In terms of an outline, I thought I would start off with some background, then some imaging pitfalls, talk about some specific uses of musculoskeletal imaging in terms of nuclear medicine, and then some future prospects.
So without further ado, when we talk about skeletal scintigraphy, we're typically talking about technetium labeled MDP. Uh, you can give either an empiric dose or a weight-based uh, dose. I've seen both. Um, usually you will do flow phase over the region of interest for about two minutes, followed almost immediately by tissue phase images, which typically are another two minutes, and then skeletal phase images, which are acquired three to four hours later. Now, you can often get away with just doing your skeletal phase imaging, particularly if you're looking at metastases and doing a follow-up. However, if there's any chance that you're going to want to see whether you have uh, increased blood flow and capillary permeability, as in infection or um, an osteoid osteoma for that matter, it can be very helpful to do three-phase imaging. You can use pinhole or converging collimators, very helpful in pediatrics or for small parts. And SPECT is very helpful for both increasing contrast and localization. They say SPECT alone increases contrast about 20 times over planar images. So if you really need to see something, it can be very helpful. The other thing that I honestly have become more and more of a fan of, if you have access to it, is SPECT CT. So something to keep in mind is that the bone scan changes as you age, as do most things actually. Uh, so I'm showing you a two-week-old boy by comparison with a 12-year-old boy and finally a 54-year-old woman. The big thing to remember is that you see uptake in the physes and apophyses and absent uptake in non-ossified structures. And when you think about it, it makes logical sense because tech MDP is taken up by osteoblasts as they turn over and incorporate it into the bone. So where the growth plate is, is where you actually have very brisk osteoblastic turnover. If you don't have any osteoblastic turnover, you don't see anything on a bone scan. And why is this so important? It's so important, perhaps more in the pediatric population, but the issue is, is that you can get physiologic hotspots, so to speak, on bone scans. And it's simply related to the normal ossification pattern of the bones. So don't get fooled. This is a common one. This is asymmetric focal uptake in the ischiopubic synchondrosis, which ossifies between 4 and 12 years of age. Again, if you happen to have a CAT scan, it can be very helpful for correlation purposes. Otherwise, keep in mind when you're looking at younger patients, the ossification pattern is truly key.